does lead us nicely into question three. We've already panellists and comments in the chat have identified a number of barriers and challenges uh, and some issues. So then the it's kind of like the $64 million question, isn't it? Why bother being open? So in our terms of why bother being open is because essentially when we're measured by our output to GDP and others, the creative industries completely disappears. We don't exist. Um, as far as our measurement in GDP, we're measured under arts and recreation services and for places where we are in the regions, we account for about 0.4% of jobs. So in my terms of being open, the more interdisciplinary my people are and the more experiences they get access to, then the more places they provide value, all right, I still don't get counted, but they do. They're, they're, they're wanting to move between permeable boundaries of the discipline or whatever that means, means that for us it's absolutely critical that the students are constantly moving around and being open and open to experiences and being given opportunities because my industry doesn't exist as an industry that's measurable in most places. Yeah, so that's an interesting comment about the value being hidden and I'm sure there are other professions as well that would feel the same way, Chris. Um, uh, Philip, would you like to come in on this question about why bother them being open? Yep. The two, the two biggest for me are that the majority of CSU's funding, if I'm correct, is from the government, which taxpayers paid for. Why should taxpayers pay again for education? Why can't it be open? So, you know, totally open. That's number one. The number two is, you know, I've done some work in developing countries in the region, and it's definite, it's clear that uh, people in developing countries need access to open education, you know, in terms of affordability uh, and so forth. Um, those are the two biggest for me. It, I believe it does improve the quality, effectiveness of teaching and learning because you can use OERs from other places, standing on the shoulders of others, and it reduces academic course material development time, you know, if you have OERs as a default. So those are some of the reasons why bothering with open is, is a good thing, I think. Um, the, I'd like to pick up on that point about OERs as the default. Um, because that does change the whole publishing landscape, that changes the, the academic landscape in terms of re publishing research as well, and Karen has already sort of alluded to some of this and made comments about this. So um, if, in fact, if, in fact, the vision was for a university to have OER as default... I'd like to get a response from the panel or even some comments in the chat from people as to what they think, what, what would that look like? How could that, um, how could you achieve that? Can, I'll just say something, Lynn. The um, Open Education Resource Universitas is a symposium of universities from around the world where all the subjects, everybody has come together to form this um, nonprofit university where all the subjects are based on OERs. It's free for students. Um, and that they're making it, and it's open. They use open software. They um, accredit their um, subjects by the providing uh, institution and they're using OERs. And as I think it was uh, Karen who said earlier, there's a lot of them already available in the US and Canada. 
So, so in terms of OER, so you've got the benefit to the student. We see that. there's We, we know there's research that's showing that, you know, st- students, especially students in North America who have access to open textbooks, um, prefer that, uh, of course, given the amount of uh, money that each individual student needs to invest into resourcing their education um, through a traditional published model and using textbooks, um, publishable textbooks. So I'm just interested to hear then um, how could you be, how can you make that a priority and why would universities see it as being an important priority? Karen, would you like to come in on that? Yes, I'd just like to add that, you know, the studies have proven or shown, I should say, that, you know, retention and student success goes up when they're uh, they're able to access uh, open educational resources because there have been several surveys that said that when students are under financial stress, you know, they, they don't buy books, they don't buy textbooks if they can't get access to them. So I think there's a, a very uh, strong correlation about, you know, having access to these resources in the United States and actually being able to stay on and study and be successful and then complete. Um, Min, would you like to come in on this question? Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everyone. I've just posted something in the chat that I'd just like to reiterate as well with another point is that in thinking of the environments and the open philosophy, it is about place and space. And I think there's opportunities to explore that through a range of different cultural and intellectual practices and properties. And secondly, that um, particularly in terms of um, the knowledge holders in Aboriginal Australia and some of the skills and developments there, that it's an opportunity to not only try and capture, for want of a terrible um, word, but to harness some of their knowledge and their experiences whilst we still have these people. Um, it's an elderly population and they've got, there are many ways and means to share knowledge and practices and integrate knowledge systems, for example, in Indigenous science, which is very exciting. But the nature of the openness is a way of, of really collecting, acknowledging, sharing deep historical knowledge practices which can only enrich this country. And I think one example of that is the History of Bathurst Resource um, Project, which Lynn and Val Uh, had a conversation with us initially. So there are distinct projects, very place-based projects um, that are are trying to use these different ways of cultural lenses to open up some questions about open environments, knowledge, the nature of knowledge, sharing, et cetera. And I think there's incredible benefits in doing that. Yeah. Uh, There's just a question here for you too, Min. Um, do you see any major challenges in making Indigenous knowledge open? Openness is a Western knowledge concept, so is there a potential disconnect? That yeah, was- no. Look, I, particularly through this history of Bathurst Resource Project, of which Val and Lynn were privy to some of the early conversations, it is um, very nuanced. So I can't speak for all of Australia. I can speak to what I was privy to with the Bathurst Wiradjuri group. They were very, very happy to explore the nature of openness and open knowledge sharing, particularly around their history and culture. It's something that they're all committed to be absolutely sharing through any ways and means, but with their cultural appropriateness and their acknowledgement of that knowledge. Now, that's one group, a very place-based project. It's a question to be explored across the country, I think. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Min. Um, Uh, Carolyn, would you like to come in on this um, question about why bother Mm, being open? Absolutely. And picking up on a few things, um, for me it comes back, well, it's a a huge social justice issue. So I think something Philip said about um, looking at our global reach, if I just took my discipline, for example, podiatry, if we look to India as a a huge ageing population, Uh, no podiatrists out there, you know, just look at the potential opportunity you'd have if you you could design a course and other health courses that were open and um, and integrating um, the knowledge and the expertise that you have on the ground and overseas. You know, it's the creativity that excites me about open. Um, because we're losing creativity, we have lost a lot of creativity in in higher education. So, 
uh, coming back to the why do it, if everything was designed as open, if you could have a, you know, we, we can't start from zero, but if, if you could go, hey, well, why not the default be that you design everything as open? It's very easy to to close off something that you designed as open it, and, and to make it as tight as possible. It's very difficult to make something open when it wasn't designed in that place, in it designed as that intention in the first place. So if the default was to design as open, to uh, to free up, uh, to harness creativity for you know social justice reasons, um, then you can close it down as you need to for professional registration requirements. You know if you need workplace learning and and, um, and periods of practical activity, you can build that in if you design as open to start with. You can't open up something that is very um, location based. That's that's a really difficult thing to do. Yeah, so look, I'm I'm interested in this too because I, you know, there's a number of sort of um, co- um, groups, communities of practice within a particular discipline across countries who have where where academics have come together and made a point of contributing chapters to a book that becomes the main open textbook that's used by those um, universities where those academics are teaching. Um, so, so do you think then, Carolyn, just from your perspective, with, with from a discipline perspective, do you think one way of doing this could potentially be from the ground up, from the grassroots, if in fact it was disciplines claiming, taking that that stance and saying we we want to shift to you know an open approach mm, that would, within exciting. the existing structure of a university like CSU. How exciting would that be? Because um, and and it wouldn't just be one; it would be it would be interdisciplinary too. Because one discipline, you know, necessarily is rather narrow. Um, but yeah, I think to build from the from the ground up with practitioners, with your industry partners, with your academics, educational design, media tech. I think mm. this, you know, we again we struggle with with making our work truly interdisciplinary. Um, but yeah, that that creative thinking and with no barriers, with potentially no barriers because you are thinking open, would be a very exciting way to go. It's trying to work out how you make the space to actually enable that activity. That is always the the thing that grinds us to the halt, isn't it? Because it all becomes it all becomes too difficult to actually. Um, well, the logistics get in the way, and I, and I think that's always the frustrating thing. If we, how do we enable our infrastructure to <laughs> allow that? And and part of that is is to get away from, I don't know, obsessing about accountability. I think we we strangle our <laughs> we strangle our, our staff in this institution by incredible degrees of accountability. Um, for every minute of every day and and people get lost in accounting for what they're doing rather than uh, thinking creativity creatively okay okay thank you um uh, other panel um any other comments from panelists and then i'd like to open up to audio video from the floor as well with questions and comments please i just have one quick comment lynn and uh, this builds on what everybody has been saying especially around the uh, interdisciplinary approach and could we do this? I think what that would start to do is to really enhance the reputation of the organization because you start becoming a thought leader in this space. And it helps not only with being a thought leader, but it helps in the branding and the marketing, which then in turn increases students' interest, participation. So you have this whole cycle that begins. And I'll just stop there. Yeah, look, I think that's a good point. I can see the panellists nodding as well because that was going to be my next question about what university in Australia is going to be bold enough to actually make one of its distinctive, um, 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 you know, aspects or the, the, the point of distinction being open and, you know, what university would be willing to claim that space? Any comments from the floor about that? Adrian, you're most welcome to come in at this point in time. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, 
I think that when we start to talk about um, open education as a, a, as a distinctive part of the university, um, the university is taking a very strong stance as to where they believe that education should be positioned in Australia. And I think that if you if you harken back to what Val was saying beforehand, her shock at how much influence the federal government has over all of the business that we conduct, how there is an explicit um, uh, mention, even in the Universities Australia uh, response to policy two years ago, which actually speaks about students as being entrepreneurial wealth generators. Um, and that's that's a lovely phrase for you know learning for learning's sake, isn't it? Uh, but I think that a university that wants to claim this space, you need to look at your students. And for me, I look at places like the Regional University Network, where a lot of their students are regional remote. They come from low SES backgrounds, first in family. We're talking about really universities of opportunity. And when you've got that kind of cohort, I actually think you're beholden to have these conversations and to work out what is it that you are trying to do and where does your social uh, justice agenda actually sit? So I'll, I'll leave it there because this is a topic that I could talk about all day, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave those thoughts with you. Okay. Uh, if anyone else would like to come in on that comment, those comments from Adrian, because I actually think he's just described a number of characteristics of CSU, to be honest. Um, so would anyone in the panel like to add to that, comment about that? Yes, look, I'll, I'll say it and type it actually at the same time and it's, it's actually a... a uh, not a message or an ethos or just it's a positioning, I guess, that I was expressing in our ADCAR change management workshops at CSU in Wagga last week, and that is, you know, shifting actually from an individualistic sort of positioning into a collectivist sort of notion and positioning and, and surely under an open sort of philosophy around learning and teaching, we can, if we, if we work towards... Um, participating in ways of that collective imagination and that collective mind and some of those collective practices, I think they might go hand in hand and I think that's worth exploring. Okay. Okay. So I'm sensing, um, uh, I am sensing that, you know, there's opportunities there. Even within CSU, there's opportunities. So uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but I'd love some comments both in chat or people both on the panel and on the floor if you'd like to share via audio. Um, where to next? What would you suggest where to next for CSU in moving towards open? Give me your 10-second elevator pitch. Anyone's welcome to come in and have a go. Well, I see I see Chris has uh, started with a space. He's got, he developed in the chat, there's an interdisciplinary space to begin for CSU. Maybe that's one way. Maybe another uh, seminar, gathering, webinar like this might be another way. We bring in interested people, talk, get some ideas going on so it's interactive see what we could do on a small scale and how we might leverage that. Okay. Are the comments, Carolyn? Uh, well, I was going to say, how about trying to work out how we share what we already have in terms of resources? We, even in our school, we replicate things to the nth degree mm. and multiply that across schools and faculties and the university. Is there some uh, idea that we may get to a point where we at least share learning resources that we have across? So people, in terms of freeing up people's time, coming back to creative thinking and practice, that we aren't all churning out the same stuff. And that's a sort of a tangible um, and re it should be a reasonably feasible thing to do in terms of looking at what we've got and working at how to share it even if it's you know some sort of large database I don't know. <laughs> Karen would you like to um, have a, a last word here? I just we talk about collaboration and there are already a lot of um, well some small Australian activities but you know there are some in international OER um, groups and of course the open textbook movement the open textbook library open in Europe it would be good to sort of get involved in a sort of uh, 
not just in Australia but internationally with the open resource movement. So I don't know whether Philip um, has any advice on, on his involvement with OER, but I think that might be good. Okay. Uh, thanks, Karen. Adrian, you put your hand up. <laughs> Yeah, there was, there was one thing, and I think that Karen has raised a really excellent point, um, and I, I wanted to expand on that a little bit, that um, if we are going to engage, and this is just my view, if we're going to engage in openness, let's not look at ways to build bespoke cottage industries within our own universities, but rather look at who we can collaborate with. So for example, one of my big push um, at the moment for USQ is for us to not invest in an open repository, but instead go where the practitioners are. Go to somewhere like the OER Commons and let's make it institutional policy that we will share where everybody else shares rather than creating something of your own, because we simply know that one of the key reasons people don't engage with OER is because they're so difficult to find. They're all over the place. And so let, let's start to try and consolidate the community a little. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adrian. Um, okay, look, we've, there are quite a, quite a few comments have been made in the chat. And so if uh, people uh, have, uh, both, both the panellists, I know Philip and um, Chris have already had to go, um, but uh, panellists or any, any of our participants, if you would like to sh just share in the chat your, um, you know, your top one, two, even three, uh, challenges or issues that you would like to just put on record in the chat, that would be really helpful because then it's bringing together, um, it's providing us with more documentation that will help us be able to move forward uh, with a, a number of the, the, at least with sort of moving from this panel to further discussion to see if we can be moving forward. I'd like to thank each of our uh, panellists today, um, Val, Carolyn, Karen, Min, um, Chris and Philip for um, coming on board today. Many thanks, Adrian, um, for coming in at, and um, being part of this hour's discussion. I think within an hour we've actually generated an incredible uh, number of ideas, um, insights that we can actually be building on. So it's actually been quite a powerful collective collaborative effort in itself. Um, so I'll um, please um, keep adding your comments. I won't close this uh, Zoom meeting for about another 10 minutes just to give those who are really keen to get their ideas down. But I understand that pe other people may need to be moving on to other um, meetings or classes and so on. So thank you, everyone, for your contribution. I think it's been a really valuable um, hour of discussion about uh, open and, and actually engaging with that question, like, you know, why bother? I think you've given us some answers um, to pursue why we should be bothering with open at CSU. So thank you.